little bit better. But for those of you who are here and regular, I do just want to go over a few announcements in the life of the church this week. Uh, be notified Monday, uh, tomorrow night, we're going to have our normal, regular scheduled men's Bible study at 6.30. That's bi-weekly now, but it'll be here tomorrow night at 6.30. So if you're a guy and you want to come, be here for that. Next Sunday at 4 o'clock, be aware we're going to have our leadership team meeting. So if you're on that and that applies to you, be here at 4 o'clock. We'll get that taken care of. shouldn't take us too, too long. Because at 5 o'clock next Sunday, we need a little bit of help decorating for Christmas stuff. So you come be a part of that at 5 o'clock. If you're able to do that before service, that would be great. Sunday school classes are continuing to go uh, as, as normal. We're having one out there in the big room, and then Joe is still having his there. You still having theirs. Kids are still having theirs. All that's the, the same. If, as for content, um, we wrapped up our kind of conversation on, gospel, on the gospel and gospel sharing this morning, so we're going to pivot in next week in the big class. Caleb's going to start a series that he's going to do on the mortification of sin uh, by John Owen. He read it and wants to pass along some of the insights that he gleaned uh, to us. So you be there for, for that if you're interested in learning about sin, how to fight it, and the life of a believer. You be there for that. Uh, we won't have a regular time of giving this morning, but our tithing boxes are in the front and in the back. So you give as the Lord leads you to do that. I'm going to invite Brother Matt to come and pray for us, and then we will continue in worship this morning.
right, you can be seated. We're going to spend just a few moments in prayer this morning. We'll do that after I read Psalm 25, the 25th Psalm, first 15 verses. It's you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I trust in you. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who will wantonly treasure. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him he will instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Would you pray with me? Lord? Oh, Lord, we come in dependence on you, asking you to teach us. Your word tells us that you will instruct us. That you will instruct those who fear you. So, Lord, make us a people who fear you. Make us a people who trust in your steadfast love and your steadfast love alone. Lord, make us realize that, that our sin is great. Our sin against you is vile. Lord, we are our people who, who justly deserve your wrath. But, Lord, you, in your steadfast love, have been good and gracious to us to redeem us through your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you've sent him, that you have redeemed us, that you've bought us back. And, Lord, you've called us to turn from our sin and to put our trust in you. And so, Lord, inasmuch as we're Christians, we come trusting you and what you've done. And so, Lord, we know that we're desperately dependent on you. And, Lord, if you do not teach us, we will not know. So, Lord, we ask that you would teach us. We ask that you would instruct us. Lord, we know there, there are so many pressures in the world around us, even right now today, that want to teach us and want to instruct us in the ways of the world. And Lord, we ask that you would deliver us from that. Lord, would we be a people? Would you make us a people who come seeking you and we come looking at your word and where your word says to move, we move. And where your word says to stay, we stay. Lord, we need you to teach us. We need you to instruct us. We need you to make the path we should walk known for us. So, Lord, I ask right now, this morning, that you would do that. Do that for us even as we read your word. Do that for us in the preaching of your word later this morning. Lord, we are so dependent on you, and we need your help. Instruct us, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Give us your wisdom. Lord, we do pray uh, for the leaders in our country, for the officials, the people in high office. Your word tells us to do that, so we want to do that. Lord, I ask that you would give those who are leading us at the national level and the state level and the local level, Lord, wisdom and discernment. And Lord, even those of them who don't know you, Lord, I pray that you would cause them to act in a way that is in more and more accordance with your will. Lord, I pray that you would raise up in this country people who will, will be able to lead us more in a direction that's in keeping with your word. We ask that, Lord. We ask that you would do a work in the hearts of those officials, Lord, those who don't know you, that they might come to know you, Lord. Your gospel can penetrate anywhere. And so, Lord, we pray that it would penetrate in people's hearts, people in the White House and people in the State House and people at the local level. Lord, they need you. And so we want to be faithful to your word to pray for them this morning. Lord, we ask that you would do a work in them. Lord, we ask that you would continue your work in, in this body here. Lord, we have many needs. We remember our dependence as we consider ourselves. Lord, there are many among us who are struggling with, with health even this morning. There are people who aren't here for health reasons. Lord, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, that you would sustain them. We pray, Lord, in their time of, of sickness, Lord, they would continue to remember their dependence upon you. Lord, that they would draw even closer to you. We pray for those this week who are going to have surgery. I pray particularly for Mr. Lloyd. Lord, we ask that you uh, would just be gracious in uh, in that surgery, Lord, we ask that you would restore uh, the folks who are in desperate need of help to that help. Lord, we pray that we'd be a faithful church body in the midst of that. Lord, we pray for the work that you're doing all over the world. I pray this morning for my, for my friend and brother, Pastor Evgeny, as he's in 
uh, Moscow Bible Church, Lord, I, I do ask that you would continue to strengthen and sustain him as the pressures around him and the society around him are very much against the work that he's doing there. Lord, we ask that you would sustain him and strengthen him, Lord, that he would, he would never seek to minister out of his own strength, Lord, but that you would fill him, Lord, that you would show him the way that he should go and the way that he should lead that church there. We ask, Lord, that you would give your favor, continue to give your favor to the churches that they've planted over the course of the past year. We ask that, that people would continue to come and come and know you and, and put their trust in you. We ask, Lord, that those churches would be uh, able to make disciples there, disciples who go and proclaim your word for your glory. And Lord, uh, we, your people, gathered right here in Grace Chapel Baptist Church. Uh, we're just a few minutes away from the time where we will come and turn our attention fully to your word, the proclamation of it. And Lord, we know that unless you teach us, unless you instruct us, unless you, by the power of your spirit, make us uh, receptive to it, nothing of substance, substance will occur. So Lord, uh, we depend on you and we need you. And we ask that you would soften our hearts to your word even now as we continue to sing in Jesus' name.
All right, well, if you want to take your Bibles with me and make your way over to Matthew chapter 7, the Gospel of Matthew and 7. Chapter will be picking up in verse 13 uh, this morning. Uh, why am I here? Why am I here? And I ask that question like, why am I here, as in, why am I not somewhere else? Right? That's a great question to ask a year into being a pastor somewhere, I reckon. But I want to answer it out loud for you this morning. I'm going to answer it out loud for you. A reason, don't worry, I've got an answer, and it's from a long, long time ago. But I just want to answer that question out loud this morning. Why am I here? I had the strangest uh, experience at Presbyterian College. If you're, not in the, if you're not aware that you're in the presence of uh, a blue hose, now you are. I'm an alumni of Presbyterian College, and I just had the strangest experience there. When I went to Presbyterian College, I went there because uh, it was the right combination of they want me to play football, and I think the piece of paper they're going to give me when I graduate will be worth something. So that was pretty much my criteria. I went there. I knew very little about what was going on, knew very little uh, about what Presbyterian College was or stood for, anything like that. I thought I knew what Presbyterians were because I'd grown up out in Filbert, and I was we were right beside Gilbert PCA, and I knew a lot of those people and respected a lot of those people. I just assumed that was kind of the flavor and tenor of Presbyterian College. Little did I know, there are multiple types of Presbyterians in the world. Turns out there are these theologically conservative Presbyterians who love the Bible, and it turns out there are these theologically liberal Presbyterians who uh, don't so much. And, and so as I went to college, I didn't realize Presbyterian was overrun with these kind of theologically liberal Presbyterians. And so as I step on the campus, I'm very quickly... Uh, faced with this question, uh, what in the world do I believe, and why do I believe it? Because I don't think I believe what these people believe. Never really asked that question in my life. Turns out that was a good question uh, to be asking, because how I would have answered that question, what in the world do I believe, didn't really comport very well at that point in time with how I was living. And so it was a really good question to be asking. And so as I'm asking that question, the Lord is, was just really gracious to me not to leave me to answer that question in my own strength, but he actually sent this cat named Brian Trail with his bald head and his big beard and his Prius uh, into my life, and, and I start talking to him, and he wants to talk to me about Jesus, and in reasons that can only be explained by God's providence, I was interested in, in hanging around and, and having that conversation. And so over time, I, I continue to, to learn from him and be confronted with my sin and the reality of it and the weight of it, one thing leads to another, and, and all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, repentance shows up, like genuine I hate my sin and I don't want to live in it anymore type repentance shows up. First time, first time in my life that's ever happened, even though I've been saying I've been a Christian for years and for years. And, and now as I look back, it's really clear to me that as a baby Christian, somebody who's just been granted a repentant heart, new heart with new desires, the Lord also gave me a little bit of discernment to look around and start figuring out some of what was going on. I've been really confused about who are all these people who, who say they're Christians, but they don't the Bible, and they, they don't treat sin like Jesus treats sin, and they don't take holiness seriously like the Lord takes holiness seriously. They don't share the gospel like Jesus commands us to share God. Like, what, what's going on? And it occurred to me at that point in time, I had this revolution, my Copernican revolution. My world turned upside down at Presbyterian College when it occurs to me that there are some people who call themselves Christians who aren't Christian. Then that made life make so much more sense to me. And I've kind of seen that happen there, and I look at these people who don't love the Bible, don't have the same reverence for Jesus, don't have the same reverence for God, who he is, and, and I, I clicked. And then I came home. I'd come home for winter break, or I'd come home for, for summer break, and I'd be in the local church, and I'd be in context, or, or in and around context like this one. This is home for me. And, and it occurred to me that I wasn't an anomaly. There's a lot of people like me. There's a lot of theologically conservative people who aren't Christians either. The difference was they knew. They knew because they were good Americans. They were good Southerners. They knew we, we can't say we don't respect the Bible. We've got to say we respect the Bible. We've got to say we love Jesus. We've got to say we love God. We've got to say all these things. challenge is when the Bible gets inconvenient for me, do I act on it? Yeah, I love, I love Jesus. I'm all about Jesus. I believe in Jesus. He loves me. That's great. I love me too. Like, I'm all about Jesus. Jesus no, problem, no problem at all with Jesus. But sin? Like, my, my sin nailing Jesus to the cross? I don't know about that. 
God calls me to be holy, like holy as he is holy, I, I'm just going to see that and I'm going to choose to believe that God was talking to pastors and people singing in the choir. That's like extra credit type stuff. That's not, that's not for me. I don't, I don't have to do that. What, what occurred to me in my experience there was, okay, there's lots and lots of different types of people who are calling themselves Christians who are not Christians. If that's the case, if that's the case, even in a place like this, like even in a place like York County, like buckle of the Bible Belt type place, why would I, why would I come back and invest my life, pour my life into a context so theoretically saturated with churches where there's a Bible on every nightstand where people got to go to church so their granny doesn't get mad at them? Like, why is this a good place to spend my life? Because if what I discovered at college is true and applies to us, it means there's an awful lot of people who don't know the Lord and who aren't disciples, aren't Christ followers, aren't Christians the way that Jesus defines it. And therefore, they stand in much as much need of the true gospel, the unadulterated gospel being proclaimed to them as any other people on the face of the earth anywhere. There's a great need in a context like this one. That's why I'm here. Why don't I tell you that this morning? <laughs> because Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount with the text that we're going to see this morning, which is absolutely a straight up, right down the middle, grab two seams and let her eat fastball, aimed at establishing the fact that not everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian. Let's read the text and see if I'm crazy or not. Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are, are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. For thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I would have declared them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Would you pray with me? Lord, again, we need your help. We're dependent on you. We ask this morning that you would bind the strong man that his house might be plundered by your word. Make us receptive to it. Teach us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not, I'm not lying to you. I didn't tell you a lie. Do you think Jesus is concerned about letting you know that not everybody who says they're a Christian is a Christian or what? I'm not making this up. Here's how he starts the last section. We've watched discipleship, right? Five, six, thus far in seven. Discipleship. What does it look like to be a disciple? And now Jesus is about to clarify, and not everybody who says they're a disciple is a disciple. Not everybody who wants to put on the show they're a disciple is a disciple. So here he goes. Here's how he starts this. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. The gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So here you go. There's two gates. There's a narrow gate, and there's a broad gate. Now, this broad gate, being broad, is easy. Easy to go through a broad gate. Not sure if you ever try to go through a gate. But the broader it is, the easier it is to 
go through, the more people can fit through it. There's a broad gate, a gate that comes very natural to you to want to walk through. I'm going to choose this broad, easy path, natural to you, not a lot of effort. Jesus says, beware though, here's the challenge, that broad gate that's easy to walk through, natural to follow, this broad, easy path, it leads you to destruction. Just be aware of that. If you're on the broad path, the easy walking path, the popular path, that path is going to lead you to, Jesus says, destruction. How many people are on it? Jesus says, many. There are lots and lots of people who are not disciples. Jesus just wants you to understand that. There's a broad path leading you to destruction. It's going to be walked by people who are not living their lives unto the Lord. People who are not bound for heaven. And there's a lot of those people, many. There's also this narrow gate. So the narrow gate, narrow, and it's harder to walk through. It's a narrower path. It's not as easy. It does not come natural to you. Like if you lean on your human flesh and what do I in my own strength want to do, you're not going to be on this path because it doesn't come easy or natural to you. It's going to take a new heart with new desires that will cause you to stop living for you and say, I want to live unto the Lord like Jesus has called me to do for these last three chapters. And if you actually live your life unto God, it would mean you're on this narrow path that is admittedly harder to walk because you're actually going to be at war with your sin. But take note, this path is the one, this gate, this narrow gate, it's the one that leads to life. It does not lead you into destruction like the broad path. This narrow path actually leads you into life. And so even though it's harder to walk, it's clearly the right path. The path that gives you life. Hey, how many, how many people are on it? Jesus says, few. There are few people who are on it. Now, I'll tell you something else I know about this context, as in our Southern Bible Belt context. Hey, sometimes we're just not really big on, on clarity with our words. The phrase the other day. Does anybody like the phrase the other day? I'm a big fan of the phrase the other day. I'm just going to warn you, though. Sometimes when I use the phrase the other day, I, like, I literally use that phrase to mean any other day that's not today. Like, do y'all remember uh, the other day when I told you that the Lions were going to lose on Thanksgiving Day? I remember that. Tom said it was three and a half months ago. Yeah, the other day. It's not today, right? The other day, three and a half months ago. It, it, we're just not big on clarity sometimes. I'll tell you what, we're also like that with this word few. Now, there are some of you in the room who understand the English language. You're like my mother, and you would say that a few equals like three. But I'm just here to tell you, that's not always the case, okay? If you call me and say, hey, Thomas, we're going to order some chicken wings. You want to come over? Would you like some chicken wings? Yeah, I'll eat a few. I might show up and eat 27. That, that's a few. It just depends on the context. We're not real big on precision and clarity. But, hey, few. How is Jesus using it? Is there any other place in the Bible where it's talking about the issue of salvation, who's going to be saved, who's going to be delivered, and this word few is used there? And yeah, there is. There is one other instance that comes to my mind where the word few is used to talk about who's going to be saved. I'm not trying to draw, draw any one-to-one -one parallels or any one-to-one -one this equals this things. I just want to see if we can help us understand the word few. Over in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter's talking about these people who were delivered from the flood, the worldwide flood. And Peter says that in the worldwide flood, there were a few people who were delivered from the flood. And so he says in verse 20, a few, that is eight people in the entire world were delivered from the flood. A few as in eight. Now look, I don't think eight people are going to heaven. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm not a Jehovah's Witness. I don't think 144,000 people are going to heaven. That's not the point. Here's the point. There's a lot of people who are not on the narrow path. There's a lot of people who are not going to walk through the narrow gate. There's lots and lots of people who are not disciples. And here we go. Here's the rest of the text. The rest of the text this morning is, and even some of those people might call themselves disciples. Just because you say it, don't make it so. 
So let's talk about that slew of people. The whole slew of people that are on the broad path, not our narrow path people for just a second, not our narrow gate people, but our broad gate people. Let's talk about them for just a minute. There's a couple things Jesus wants you to know about those broad gate people. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Look, there's some people who are broad gate people who are walking the broad path who want to fool you. They're broad gate people, but they want you to think that they are narrow gate people. So they hold themselves out to be narrow gate people. Here's the thing. They're actually wrapping as wolves, but they come to you in sheep's clothing. Here we go. Can we put on the smoke and mirror dog and pony show? I'm going to come. I'm going to hold myself out like I'm really something, like I'm really a holy spiritual person. This is, this is what I'm after they're false prophets, so they're not just anybody. They might want a leadership position. They might want to come in and, and get in front of the sheep and let you pat them on the back and tell you how great they are and all that good stuff. They think scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees. They were all about that. So they come to you as these people who are ravenous wolves, but they want you to think they're going to walk through the narrow gate. They're on the narrow path. Why would they do that? Why, why would you do something like that? Remember chapter 6, that was just a few weeks ago. The first half of chapter 6, we, we saw these people. There's, there's some people who, who, who are living for the approval of man who want to get their kicks by putting on a show for these religious people who pat them on the back. Right? You remember the alms. Hey, people give alms. We show them we give alms. There's some people who give alms in such a way that you know they give alms, and they're doing that so that you'll pat them on the back. That's what they're living for. They're living for you to say, congratulations, you're doing a great job. There's some people who pray, and they pray in such a way that you would say, wow, I've never heard somebody pray like that. You want to know how they pray like that? So that you would say, wow, I've never heard somebody who could pray like that. There are some people who do that. There are some people who fast. They, they, they don't eat food so that you would look at them and say, wow, that is really extreme. Do you see how good and rigorous and serious and religious about fasting these people are? There, there's some folks who do that so that you would turn, the undiscerning would turn and say, wow, that's really something. That's some people. Some people who are walking on the broad path want you to think they're on a narrow path. That's just how it is. And Jesus extends that this morning to this whole false prophets thing. And there's clearly a fine line here, right? Because when we go back to chapter 6 and we talk about giving to the needy, right? We want to give to the needy, obviously. We want to pray. We ought to fast. Like, but there's nothing wrong with those things, but there's a fine line here. Are we doing it for the approval of man or are we doing it for the approval of God? And Jesus extends that same conversation into the realms of of false prophets this morning. Again, there's a fine line. Because I'm assuming you want somebody to come to you and proclaim the word of the Lord, right? You can say, Man, that's why I'm here, right? I'm assuming you want somebody to come and proclaim the word of the Lord to you. I'm assuming you want me to stand up on Sunday mornings and say something to you in a thus saith the Lord type manner. I hope that's what you want, because I understand that to be a foundational component of my job, if I'm going to do my job well, like if I'm going to speak from the Lord's word towards you, it's going to take me being in touch with the word, in touch with the Lord, in touch with the sheep that the Lord has entrusted me to shepherd. It's, it's going to take all those things. And brothers and sisters, you ought to want me to do my job well. Like I want me to do my job well. I want to preach a good sermon every week. That's my goal. Can I faithfully communicate the word of the Lord to you People, how do I apply it to you? What would be a helpful way for you to hear it? Like, I'm trying to do that. I want to preach a good sermon every week. I want me to do my job well. You ought to want me to do my job well. That's what we're at. On the spectrum of there's good preaching, and there's mediocre preaching, and there's preaching that's masquerading as preaching, which is actually something else. Like, I want to be as far on this end of the spectrum as we can be. The word of the Lord faithfully communicated to you. I want to do my job well. You ought to want me to do my job well. If you ever get the sense that I've stopped preaching to you, though, and I've started preaching for you, please fire me. Like, for the good of my soul and for the protection of this church, fire me. If I stop preaching for, for the Lord's approval and I start preaching for your approval, please fire me. Thomas, that's a fine line. How, how do we discern that like, there's a fine line there? There is a fine line, but there's a clear line. 
How will we tell, Thomas? How do we, how do we know if somebody's a, a false prophet, if somebody's putting on a dog and pony show? Don't worry. Jesus got a litmus test for you. Verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. Brothers and sisters, this is the key. Fruit. What does it produce? If somebody comes to you in the name of the Lord, proclaiming to speak in the name of the Lord, but you look at them and you look at their life, and everything in their wake is just cloaked in chaos, doesn't seem to be genuine. Looks like they're putting on a show. Maybe they're masquerading. Maybe, maybe they're saying there's somebody they're not. Surely you know this happened. Like, surely we could point fingers. Surely we could name names. I, I don't think that you don't know what I'm talking about. We're not pointing fingers this morning. Right now, like we're talking, this is Jesus' word to us. Like we need to be a discerning people. This is not an invitation to be a snap judgment type people, a one, a single issue judgment type people. I'm not, I'm not trying to convince us into being a judging people. I seem to remember Jesus the other week saying stuff like, judge not. <laughs> so we're not supposed to be this judging, condemning people, but we're supposed to be this discerning people who say, I wonder if, is this person on the narrow path or do they just want me to think they're on the narrow path? And Jesus says, you look and see by examining the fruit. Thomas, I thought it wasn't about what I did. I thought it wasn't about all that stuff. I thought about what Jesus did. Right. Correct. And I just submit to you this morning that if we're a people who really genuinely believe that Jesus is who he says he is and has commanded us what he's commanded us, it's going to impact our lives. We're not earning our salvation by what we do, but the Bible very clearly teaches that if we are a saved, converted, regenerate, narrow path people, that's going to mean something for our lives. It's the whole root versus fruit issue. The Bible over in Ephesians chapter 2, maybe it's the clearest place in the world uh, we could see this. Chapter 2 beginning in verse 8, Paul writes, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay? Paul repeats himself sometimes when he really wants you to understand stuff. And, and that's what he just, just did right here. So you were saved by grace, like God's free, unmerited favor Toward you. That's how you got saved, and you got saved by grace through faith. Did I do that or not, Paul? Can you help me understand? This is not your own doing. You didn't do it. It's the gift of God. God's given you this gift. Paul, did my works influence that decision? Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Like, brothers and sisters, it's not about what you're able to do, it's about what Jesus has done on your behalf. Does that mean anything for me? Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The root of our salvation is Jesus Christ crucified for me to take God's wrath from my sin in himself that I might live forever with him if I turn from, from my sin and put my trust in him. All about Jesus, not about me. And then from that root of my salvation, there's this fruit that's produced, and the fruit is good work. There's going, that's going to produce something in my life. So my question for you, brothers and sisters, is when we look at the fruits in our lives, like what does it say about us? What type of fruit is being produced in our lives? Is it the fruit of the Spirit, or is it the, the result of the flesh? It's a question we got to ask, a question we got to answer. And, and the answer is going to help us a lot because, look, you don't get good fruit from bad trees. You don't get bad fruit from good trees. So if the fruit of your life is, oh, wow, it's the works of my flesh, then guess what? You're a bad tree. If the fruit in my life is a result of, wow, the Lord is, is willing and working in me for his good pleasure, this lines up with what the word says I should do. Good. You have confidence. You have confidence. You're a good tree. You have confidence that the Lord has changed you. So, brothers and sisters, what is your fruit like? When your sin is brought to your attention, is there repentance? Are you quick to turn and say, I, I, I don't want this in my life. I actually want to lean on the Holy Spirit to put this to death. Like that, that's a good fruit. A willingness to forgive. 
When someone sins against you, do you, do you harbor that? Do you put that deep in your soul? Or do you say, how can I, someone who's been forgiven so much, forgive this person? That's a good, normal fruit that we expect to be produced in the Christian's life. A desire for the Word of God. Like, does, does your soul yearn for God's Word? Do you want to read the Word? Do you want to sit under the Word? Is it miserable for you right now that I'm preaching the Bible? Do you wish I would go back to telling stories? Like, it's a good fruit to want the Word. That's good. That's right. That's normal in the Christian life. Is that characteristic of you? What about peace? The Holy Spirit produces peace in us. And what I would expect if the Holy Spirit is indwelling you is that your household would be growing in peace. So wh what's going on in your life? What's going on in your household? Is it characterized by peace? That's a good, normal fruit of the Christian life. What about our freedom from sin? Sin that's clung so closely to you in your, in your unsaved life where you're able to see, hey, I'm growing in greater and greater freedom from it. Brothers and sisters, Normal, normal good fruit that God produces in us through the power of His Spirit at work in those who are being saved. Is that us? Is that true of you? Are you someone who's walking the narrow path and has a little bit of fruit to show for it? Or are you someone who's walking the broad path but comes to church and wants people to think that you're walking the narrow path? Oh, how I pray that you're a person who's legitimately on the narrow path, who's going to walk through the narrow gate, and not a person who just wants people to think that you're going to walk through the narrow gate. But brothers and sisters, there's also another category. There are some who, who want to fool others, and then there are some who are fooled themselves. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of love. If you're here uh, last week, I just want you to cast your mind back for a second to that section we looked at in verses 7 through 11. You shouldn't have a hard time remembering that. What Jesus was teaching us in verses 7 through 11 is that, look, the life of the disciple, the Christ-following life, the life of the Christian is a life lived in radical dependence. We come to the Lord asking and seeking and knocking, knowing that if he doesn't open, we can't do anything. So we're a dependent people. The life of the disciple is a dependent Life. We are dependent on the Lord. We are trusting in Him and Him alone to provide. These folks who are coming, who, who, who have fooled themselves, they've actually fooled themselves by forgetting their dependence. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's, who's in heaven. So it's not about profession. Lord, Lord, are you or are you not living under God? Are you or are you not being conformed to the will of God? And look, brothers and sisters, the will of God is more for you than a checklist. Do you remember the Beatitudes? They were attitudes. It's not primarily about what you do, it's about who you are. And if you are the right person, if the Lord's actually given you a new heart, the right actions will follow. So it's not a checklist. Here's the problem. Verse 22, we got people who want to act like it's a checklist. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name, Lord, look at what we've done. Look at how impressive this is. Look at the show we've been able to put on. Look at all these good deeds we've done. Look at what we've been able to do. Didn't I do all these things? They've forgotten their dependence. And because they've forgotten their dependence, which is a fundamental reality and attitude of the disciple, here's what they hear. I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Yeah, you did a lot of things. But you did them for you. Or you did them in your own strength. Jesus says, you didn't, you didn't do them for me. We, we, we don't have a relationship. Yeah, great, 
you, you did all these things, but you didn't do them trusting in me. You forgot your dependence upon me. You became dependent upon yourself. And as soon as you became dependent upon yourself, you forgot that I called you to be humble. You forgot that I called you to reach and seek me. You forgot that I called you to be a people deeply dependent on me. You became dependent on you. And when you became dependent on you, that's where you lost it. And people quick to point to themselves and what they are able to do. Brothers and sisters, this is just an absolutely particular challenge for us in this context. One of the values that, that dominates this context or, or maybe flavors this context or maybe we're trying to recover in the, the context that we're in is the whole bootstrap value. That I would pick myself up by my bootstraps and I would do something. I would make something of myself. I'd work hard. I wouldn't take no for an answer. I would stop whining and find a way to get it done. And I'm just, I just want to tell you, like, again, I'm really glad for that. That's a really good approach to most of life. <laughs> I really hope you're a hardworking person, you got a good work ethic, that you don't want to sit around and whine and complain. Like, I, I really actually hope that that characterizes most of your life. But here's what you got to know. That I'm a really hard worker gets you nowhere with God. You, you are not going to bootstrap your way into the kingdom of God. You will not bootstrap your way into earning favor and merit with God. No, you were saved by grace through faith, and you didn't do it. You can't do it. It's got to be a gift of God that you respond to in repentance and faith. And so when we say things like, didn't I prophesy? Didn't I cast out these demons? Didn't we do many mighty works? We're missing. We will not bootstrap our way into the kingdom of God. A particular challenge for us. I'm so glad. I'm so grateful that Christians and in broader Christian circles, we're starting, to, we're starting to think deeply again. That's it's good. I'm glad. I'm glad to see it. I'm glad there are so many good books circulating now. I'm glad that there, there's so many things for us to go and grab onto and, and learn from and, and actually apply to our life. That's great. But brothers and sisters, in our knowledge, don't forget to pin didn't I learn a lot of things? Didn't I buy a lot of books? Didn't I build a good library? Didn't I take a lot of classes? Like, didn't I do all these things? Last time I checked, verse 7 said you're still a beggar. And if you're going to get in the kingdom of God, it's going to be by begging. You're not going to get in by knowing a lot of stuff. I'm really grateful as well. I'm really grateful that, that we, we serve. I'm so grateful that we serve. But brothers and sisters, don't let your serving turn into dependence on you. Didn't I go to church all the time? Didn't I volunteer for all these things? Didn't I spend all this time in the church building? Didn't I spend all this time in the community helping these people? That's, that's great. That's fantastic. But that doesn't save you. You will not work your way into the kingdom of God. You will be granted access into the kingdom of God if you come dependent fully on Jesus, not on you. Another big danger for us. Some people think they're going to get in by what they didn't do. Didn't I avoid these things? I, I did not, I, I, I got this belief in God, and this belief in the Bible, and this belief in Jesus that I just kind of say, and then I turn around and look at the fact that I, ha I haven't murdered anybody. I haven't committed adultery. I don't, I'm not perpetually stealing stuff. I don't cuss much. I don't drink or smoke or dance or hang out with people who, who do. Like, look at all these things I've been able not to do. Surely that is fruit that I'm in the kingdom of God, I've been able to do or not do all these things. I just want to say that any combination of those things have deceived so many people. Amen. So many people have been deceived by the fact they've been able to do or not to do certain things. I've got this belief in the Bible and this belief in Jesus and this belief in God. And I've pointed all these checklists of things that I think I've decided to make me a good person or make me fit for the kingdom of God. And so therefore, I just go on about my business and I sleep good at night because I've convinced myself I'm fine. And Jesus' word to you this morning is, you fooled yourself. Your good works are supposed to be a fruit that ought to be a fruit. You've turned them into a root. And you've said, this really makes me something. This is going to earn me something. Surely I'll get in the kingdom of God because I've done blank. And if that's you, you are not walking the narrow path. You're on the broad path because you're depending on you, just like every other person ever in every other religion ever. It's dependent on you. Look at what I do. Brothers and sisters, pay so much attention. Do not miss that. You can be a broad gate person 
and think you're fine. You can be a broad gate person and convince yourself that you're fine. Everything's okay. It's about what I'm able to do. And Jesus says, no, remember, if you would be a narrow gate person, you actually will have to do not the actions, the will of my father. You'll have to be conformed to me. You actually have to walk in my ways as a humble, dependent disciple. If you would enter in the narrow gate, that has to be you. So Jesus says, look, there's those who have fooled others. There's those who have fooled themselves. And now we've got to answer the question, so what are we going to do? And what does it actually come down to? Jesus, can you boil this thing down to brass tacks? Sure he can. We've got to answer the question, are we going to act on Jesus' words or are we not going to act on Jesus' words? Which means, do we think Jesus' words are authoritative or do we not think Jesus' words are authoritative? Verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does, not, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Are we going to act on Jesus' words or are we not going to act on Jesus' words? Do we think Jesus' words are authoritative, or do we not think Jesus' words are authoritative? Because you got a choice. There's those who hear. There's those who hear Jesus' words. They, they hear him say these things. They hear him describe for the last two and a half chapters. What does it look like to be a disciple? And they say, I want to get in line with that. I want to conform to that. Like, I actually trust that Jesus is who he says he is, and so I want to adopt that attitude. I want to adopt those behaviors. I want to be that disciple. And then there are those who hear Jesus' words. They hear the last two and a half chapters of Jesus explaining what does it look like to be a disciple, and they're not willing to be conformed to it. No problem with hearing it. No problem with saying stuff like, I believe it. No problem with saying, like, I'm willing to go to church and hear the preacher talk about it. I'm willing to sit in my house and read about it. I'm willing to get in a small group and talk to them about it. No problem with that. But in terms of being conformed to it, like, I'm going to hear those words and act on it. No, thank you. No, thank you, Jesus. I would much rather keep you at arm's length. Thomas, wait. I'm sorry. I thought this was not about what I did. I thought it was about what Jesus has done on my behalf. Correct. And if you actually trust in Jesus, you're going to be pretty convinced he knows what he's talking about. If you're actually coming to him, agreeing with him that he is God and that he alone can secure your reconciliation to the Father, you're, you're going to think he's, he's pretty credible to tell you how to live. So are we going to get in Jesus's in line with Jesus' words or not. If we trust him, we're going to be quick to get in line with Jesus' word. Here, here's what that means. Practically, let's apply it Sermon on the Mount. You've heard Jesus say, you've heard Jesus say things like, if you are harboring anger in your heart towards someone, you are in sin. Which means, like, if I want to get in line with that, that means, okay, I'm going to have to work to forgive this person, I'm going to have to actually act on this. Jesus is saying like that might even mean me going to them and seeking out reconciliation. I'm not going to be able to do the thing where I keep them in arms. They can just say like, I'm going to continue to act like they're dead to me because they really are. I'm actually going to just remove myself from this situation. I don't want anything uh, to do with that. I'm going to have to stop talking about this person. I'm going to actually have to, to act like something's going to have to, to happen. I can't harbor this anger because it's sin, and Jesus died for sin. And so I can't continue to live in sin. Like, that's what Jesus has said. So if you come to that and you say, oh, well, that's her problem, or that's his deal, or he's going to have to get over that, or he's just going to have to move on because I've moved on, I'm done with it. We're not acting on Jesus' word. Jesus' word said, don't do that. Don't harbor the anger. If there's reconciliation, you've got to figure out what you've got to do to make it happen so that you can live at peace with this person. 
It's a reproach to Christ that the only thing that people outside of the church know about the church is their drama. It is offensive to Jesus that the only thing that people can see about his bride are her blemishes. So let that, let that not happen here. May that not be true of us. May we be a people who actually hear Jesus' word and say, Jesus, I will get in line with that. I will not let the local church be a soap opera. I'll do whatever I've got to do to be reconciled to my brothers and sisters in Christ. You've heard Jesus say. You've heard him say things like, if your right hand causes you sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you sin, tear it out. So Jesus is saying to you, like, lust has to be driven out of your life at all costs. So if you turn around and say things like, well, everybody watches that TV show. Everybody else got that app. They watch those movies. They talk about those things. They make jokes about those things. They scroll down that website too. You're not acting on Jesus' words. You're trying to keep Jesus at arm's length. You're doing that thing where you've convinced yourself you're a disciple even though you don't have the disciple's attitude. Jesus is not saying that like, it's not what a Christ follower does. That's not what a Christian does. And so let's just apply it to ourselves. If you're one of those type of people, or you pick any other sin you want to in the Sermon on the Mount, those are the first two I came to. If you pick, you can pick any other sin that you want to. Jesus says if you do something like that, you're a fool. You're being foolish. You're building your house on sand. Like if you think, I'll just be selective about when I obey Jesus or what words I want to listen to or whether I'm going to conform myself to those words or not. Jesus is saying you're building a house on the sand and houses that build, get built on the sand, they get destroyed, which means they get punished, which means they go to hell. This isn't like a story about how you ought to build stuff. This is about what, who judgment comes to. And judgment's coming to those people who are walking the broad path because they will not act on Jesus' words. So if you won't act on Jesus' words, you're building your house on the sand like he's talking about. Destruction is your end. If you hear these words and say, yes, I will act on them, you're building your house on the rock and you can be assured that it's going to continue to stand. Be aware. In light of all we've seen today, if you refuse to live your life unto God, if you refuse to hear Jesus' words and act on them, you are headed for destruction. And you're like the one who builds the house on the sand. You're like the one who walks through the, through the broad gate. That's you. And it does not matter who you tell us you are. That, 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 that is true of you completely regardless of whether you give lip service to Jesus or not. Jesus doesn't live, need your lip service. It does not impress him very much. You can fool us. You can fool yourself. You ain't going to fool Jesus. We're going to act on Jesus' words or not. Do we think they're authoritative or not? You may have missed it this morning. I didn't spend a lot of time drawing it out, but I would point you to two things in this text. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount? You've got these people coming. You've got these disciples who have just decided they're going to follow Jesus and commit to Jesus. You apparently have this crowd that gathers around because we're going to see the crowd here at the end. And, and people are trying to figure out, who exactly is this man? What exactly is going on? And Jesus gives them two massive hints this morning. Verse 21 Verse 21, Jesus asserts that the proper name for him is Lord. That's a massive grab of authority. I'm re Jesus is reaching for authority and saying, it's mine. You call me Lord. And then verse 23, I don't know if you call this or not. Jesus says he has the right to cast people into hell. Massive authority. But he, Jesus is saying he has a massive amount of of authority. When you hear Jesus do those two things, you've got to decide, is Jesus a liar? Like, is he lying about that? Or does he actually have massive authority? Big decision we've got to make. Here's the verdict at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Verse 28. When Jesus finished these saying, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The people hearing Jesus that day, they say, huh. 
tongues going on here? This is not what this is not how we're used to people teaching us. He is not up here making suggestions to us right now. He's not just another scribe or Pharisee or, or rabbi who's come and is just teaching us all these different things about human tradition so that we'll turn around and pat him on the back. Like, no, this seems different. He's teaching like he's got authority. My friends, you've got to figure out what you're going to do with that this morning. Because Jesus has not allowed you the space you would need to write the finish. It's not there. You're either one who's hearing his words and acting on them, or you're not. And no one cares what you call yourself if you're on the broad path or on the narrow path. If you're on the broad path and you're saying, I'm a Christian, Jesus is saying, great, that means you're conformed to my word. Brothers and sisters, what is it for you? You've got to decide. Are we going to hear Jesus' words and act on them? Do we think, do we trust that he has authority or do we not? If you're not willing to act on his words, it would be way better off if you would just come out and say it. I think Jesus is a liar. That's fine. At least that's honest. At least we know where to start. At least, at least we know what we're working with. At least we put our, ourselves in a position where we can be vulnerable and we can tell the truth. Like If I'm not willing... To conform myself to Jesus, that means I think he was lying when he said he was my Lord. If that's you, that's fine. Just don't pay him lip service on your way to doing that. Jesus actually would rather you not pay him lip service on the way to doing that. It helps the church when you don't pay him lip service on the way to destruction. Or, are you willing to act on do you really believe that he has authority? And if you really believe that Jesus has authority, then guess what? You will act on his word. You will agree with him that he is Lord. And not just the Lord, but you'll agree with him that he's my Lord. My friends, what's he going to be for you? We pray for Lord, we do thank you that you really are Lord. I pray that right now, in this sober moment of silence, that you would give us lots of clarity about whether you're our Lord or not. We do not want to be a people who try to deceive others. We do not want to be a people who are deceived ourselves. So, Lord, I pray that you would grant by the power of your Holy Spirit to each and every one of us the discernment that we need to know whether we are a people who are willing to act on your words or whether we think you're lying about who you say you are. Lord, work in our hearts and our minds right now as we respond. We are going to have uh, just a brief hymn of response this morning. I'll be on the front row worship with you guys. If there's anything you'd like to pray with me about, talk with me about, get clarity on, come do that now.
blessing and privilege to be able to spend this part of the Lord's Day in, uh, in this place with you. Uh, do be reminded of what we've got going on the rest of the week. We'll see you tonight if you're able to make it there for that. I'm going to read our benediction this morning from James uh, chapter 2. Then we'll sing the doxology and we will be dismissed. Here's the word of the Lord. So also faith by itself if it does not have works is dead. Someone will say you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe. Would you sing the next